Hope you all appreciate the fact that we've brought to you now probably cumulative 20 years worth of back cumulative 20 years worth of background information that's brought us up to the point where we are today. And once again, where we are today is what, Aaron? A product launch, right? And so the next couple of slot, the next couple of presentations that, that we have begin to lay out to you the, um, the work that's gone on, the work that's going on, and the work that will be represented in the final product presentation. Uh, I have the opportunity to present to you for um, a very important member of the of the uh, Aptimune team, Dr. St or, uh, Steve Berger, um, who many of you know and have had the chance to work with over the years. Uh, a, a, dis a description of how we have um, made more consistent this lipid uh, 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 micro nanoparticle uh, presentation. And so, again, we've talked about the virus, we've talked about the cells, <laughs> we've talked about the intranasal application, we've talked about the the um, the right, but it, but the, the the really very finely tuned. <laughs> Delivery of that adjuvant component onto the onto the microparticle, and so now we're at the the, the where the uh, interface with the animal really really exists. So let's come back again to what macrophages do. Macrophages start that immune cascade by 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 phagocytosis. They don't take in huge particles. They kind of ignore small particles. So you've got to get the right sized particle, and. Um, Aptimune has selected through a couple of different op a couple of different suppliers and, and, and technologies uh, to come up with a partner that's, that is able to provide to them at a commercial scale the product that is best adapted to bring all of those components together. Um, consistency is important. Consistency is important, and so within this manufacturing process, we're able to demonstrate on a lot by lot basis that there's an acceptable there's an acceptance criteria. Uh, for the size and the consistency and the charge of those products. Um, this is just a, uh, a kind of a geeky way for us to be able to show to you that, that in fact, they all fall into that range, and, and you've got some shots there to, to help to support that, um, which then come back together in that final formulation step of bringing the, uh, with the appropriate size, with the appropriate charge, the antigen and the, an and the uh, um, adjuvant coming together to form this uniformly sized, and you can see really very small uh, uh, range of variation in the size of that, of that finished particle. Um, the process uh, that, that has been established by, by, by Steve and colleagues and the, and the collaborator, um, it's, a, it's a sterile process. Uh, somebody met, I think somebody, you mentioned organic solvents in the process. We've come up with a process that does not include any kind of a, of a, of a uh, uh, negative byproducts associated with the uh, uh, formulation. Um, the product is, is, and we've got folks that are involved in the manufacturing process here, we can say, although this is not a grow it, kill it, uh, put it in a bottle and stick it, this is a assembly of, of, an intricate assembly of products. They all come together quite nicely in that final formulation. And uh, that comes back then to this notion of consistency. And... Um, I'd like to just spend a, a minute or two uh, here on, 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 this, on this topic. And I hope that we've been able to get across to you the importance of all of these different areas that need to be addressed in the vaccine, in the, vac in the, in the, in the development of this final product uh, uh, barricade. So we've established that the change in a new cell substrate is critical uh, in moving forward here. There are isolates out there that will not or will very poorly grow in the existing cell substrates. It's been addressed by a more promiscuous cell substrate, a cell substrate that may not take 100%, but it's going to take much more than the probably 40 or 50% that the, uh, that, that, that's out there today. We've demonstrated, and, and, and Gabby's been able to point out that there's not an adaptation that takes place. If there's, if anything that happens in a couple of passages within the scaling up, it's making sure that you've got the titer, the virus has had a chance to, to grow to that right titer. So two or three passages are not adaptation. They're getting the virus to a high and appropriate titer. 
that, that uh, the formulation and the route of administration, the careful consideration of the particle size, the careful consideration of the exact uh, micro, microbacterial cell wall components that are in that process um, are, are, are critical. But the other thing that's very important, and we talked a little bit before, and I didn't really get into that to, to, the, to the interference component, was Aptamine's plan is to come forward with an, act, an inactivated PERS vaccine and, 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 and hopefully quickly behind that an inactivated SIV vaccine. They are an autogenous business right now. They're going, they're, the intention is to move into uh, fully licensed products uh, over time. They're not planning to get into the Clostridium business or the Pastorella business or the Mycoplasma business. And I think any or all of you who have been involved in commercial vaccine registration and know when you go through the processes associated with demonstration of lack of interference, you know that if you've got a relatively fragile antigen like PERS and you start to throw two, two clostridiums, a, a bordetella, and, and, and three mycoplasmas on top of it, I'm not exactly sure what the pig is seeing. So we believe it's critical that if these two, these two extraordinarily important diseases, PERS and SIV, be presented as individual vaccines. Can you go multi-strains? We'll demonstrate. Yes, we believe you can, and we'll demonstrate that you can. But Clostrid, but C. difficile, and, and PERS, that's not where we're intending to go. That's not where we're intending to go. Um, the uptake of that antigen in the appropriate tissue, uh, we have other data that shows that IgG stimulation in these, in these intranasal vaccinated uh, uh, pigs is not really, really high, it really, but IgA is. So we're hitting the right tissue and getting the right kind of effector response um, by going to the, uh, the, appropriate, um, um, the appropriate uh, uh, route of administration. And I just see, Donna, don't jump on me. I just see that the change that I made yesterday to this slide Demonstration of efficacy here doesn't mean that we've, we've sought out USDA approval of efficacy for, uh, for the autogenous product. A reasonable evidence of efficacy has been established already in, in, in reasonably sized, um, uh, well-controlled studies to show that we have clearance of virus, we have uh, a, a significant reduction in clinical signs. Um, that has been established and will continue to build that, that reasonable evidence of efficacy that will drive what titer these products will be released at. And I don't believe that that's been established, certainly for the majority of the autogenous PERS vaccines that are out there. So with all of these critical elements, we believe we have an important tool to begin to address the gaps that are in place right now in the marketplace with PERS.